Greetings, everyone. I hope you all are having a great summer. We are back with our market commentary series for the month of June. Today is Tuesday, June 25th, so we're a little shy of month end, but we have enough content to talk about. Certainly, it's been a, a decent month. There's been a lot of chatter about the top heaviness of the U.S. stock market, and I'm going to look at market dynamics, U.S. large cap, how the top heaviness of the market relates to history, what that could mean for future returns. And I know this is a, this is a hot topic that we've touched on in the past. Today, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. Uh, so if you own U.S. large cap stocks, you're going to want to tune into this. And I know many of you do. It's probably your biggest exposure, namely tech. So with that said, let's get into the slides. All right, like we've done in previous month, just a snapshot of major asset classes. So this, again, is as of June 25th. So we've got, I believe, three more trading days left in the month. So this might not uh, reconcile with month-end numbers, but the s and up roughly 3%. Emerging markets continue their progress. The Dow still has that gap uh, with the S&P, which I explained last time is namely due to the way this uh, S&P 500 index is weighted really heavy in the tech names, and they've had a pretty good year. Bonds are starting to behave better as inflation comes down and the Fed starts to um, telegraph, if you will, their next cut, which could be this fall, despite what they say. It looks like the market is pricing in one or two cuts before the end of the year with those coming in the fall. But again, that can change. Gold basically flat. Foreign stocks, there's been some election issues in, in France and in greater Europe that have been affecting uh, stock prices there. And then small caps continue to, to trail. One that sticks out, so like last month, Bitcoin had a had a awesome month. It was up almost 20%. This month, we have a bit of profit taking, uh, Bitcoin down about 8% as of this recording. So all in all, a pretty good month. But again, a lot of the gains are concentrated in a handful of names. And we're going to unpack what that could mean uh, for the next phase of the cycle. Okay, so I just wrote a post last week, I believe, on the tale of two markets. And I referred to a study where it talked about how 50% of Americans think the S&P 500 is down. And I rattled off a bunch of reasons, and I won't get into those. But one of the big reasons, or one of the understated reasons, I should say, is today's investment environment could lend itself to many different outcomes and perceptions depending on how you're invested. And if you own U.S. large cap stocks, you probably think things are pretty good. If you own anything else, you're probably scratching your head a bit. And there are some extreme dislocations as it relates to the S&P 500, tech, and U.S. large cap stocks. So I'm going to expand on a few of those. And, you know, a lot of folks think that good investing is just piling into what's performed well. And actually, that's worked pretty darn well the last couple of years. However, there's no flashing red light or yellow light when the cycle turns. And I feel like today more than ever, Folks are getting caught up in FOMO as it relates to some of these popular tech names. So let's just look at some of these dislocations and how that could impact future returns. So this is a slide, this top part of the graph. Uh, I shared this last week in Tale of Two Markets. And what this shows is the ratio of the S&P 500, so U.S. large cap stocks, relative to U.S. small cap stocks. All right, the higher the ratio, the more U.S. large stocks are in favor and the lower the ratio, the more U.S. small cap stocks would be in favor. So you can see where we currently sit today, a ratio over one. And again, that means U.S. large cap stocks are in favor. Going back over almost 35 years, the only other period that comes close is right before the tech bubble burst in 1999. And like I said in my post, I don't think this is the same thing as the tech bubble where you could put .com on any company name, even if they didn't make any money, and see their stock go up. This is not like that. However, relative to some of these other equity asset classes, some experts say U.S. large cap stocks have gotten over their skis a bit. Okay, So from this extreme level, relative to the last 30 or so years, we're tracking future returns of the S&P and small cap stocks given this stretch starting point. So that's the lower part of this graph. And you can see from November 1999 to November 
2006, from this same point, U.S. small cap stocks crushed the S&P by a pretty, a pretty hefty margin here. So I'm not saying this is going to repeat itself. However, I am saying markets do move in cycles, and there's no warning sign for when this uh, leadership change happens. So again, these historical dislocations often revert. However, the market doesn't tell you when they're going to revert back to the mean or back to more of a balance. In the same spirit, we've got the same ratio here with different factors. So here we're comparing uh, U.S. growth stocks, so think tech growth names, versus value. Think older economy names, oil, industrial, staples. And again, going back over the last 35 years, the growth factor has been in favor. The value factor has been out of favor. So when this line is going up, growth is very much in favor. When this line is going down, value is in favor. You can see where we're currently at now, about 1.5 is only rivaled uh, by the tech bubble again. So same, same thing as uh, U.S. large to small. We're comparing future performance from these elevated levels, growth to value. So from July 2000 to July 2007, value really outpaced growth by almost 100%. So when you think about this, it's like a rubber band that's being stretched and stretched and stretched. And eventually that rubber band snaps and it, and it flips. That's what's happening here. And it's not uncommon. Markets uh, ebb and flow. Uh, what's, what's in favor can become out of favor. And again, I just caution folks that, that think U.S. large cap growth is going to continue this forever to exercise some caution be mindful of your position sizing and know that history has not been kind to extremes going back the last 30 to 35 years. Okay, now let's get now let's look at the weighting of the top 3 holdings in the S&P 500. And this goes back to 1980 through uh, the middle of June, so the middle of this month. So you can see this is where we're currently at. The top three names in the S&P 500 represent over 21% of the index. So that's Microsoft, Apple, and NVIDIA. Going back over the last 35 years, the closest that we come is 13.4% AT&T, ExxonMobil, and IBM. And we all know what happened to these companies. They, they very much shrank and fell out of favor. And they're still large companies, but they're not anywhere near the top three now. So what this is saying is it's great when you ascend the corporate mountain. It's really hard to stay on top. So again, just be mindful uh, investing in some of these mega companies, managing your future return expectations because it's great to own these companies as they ascend to the top of the corporate mountain. Future returns, as we'll see later, once you reach a, a certain size, can become challenged. And I have a few graphs that support that point. But certainly when you look at history, the top three names today make up a pretty sizable chunk of the S&P 500, which some experts say is a reason for caution or to rotate out of some of these larger names into other out-of-favor equity asset classes like value, like small cap. Now, zooming out, I think it's important to look at the other side of this. So what this is, is stock market concentration in the largest global equity markets. And this is as of the end of 2003. And when you actually zoom out and look at other developed country markets and how big or what percent the top one, top three, and top 10 companies make of their equity markets, the US doesn't look so bad. So the most concentrated niche economies, the smaller economies, it's not uncommon for the top 10 companies to make up 40, 50, or, or, or even 60%. And then you look at the U.S., which is the largest economy in the world, very diverse. The top 10 companies in the U.S. make up about 27, 28%, which now is a little bit bigger because this is uh, about six months stale. But again, relative to the rest of the world, the U.S. Um, top three, top 10 companies are certainly manageable. Okay, this is probably the most interesting graph that we have. And this is uh, courtesy of Morgan Stanley. So 
This is stocks with the largest market cap, so size of the company, in the U.S. between 1950 and 2023. So I'm not going to get caught up in these colors, but anytime you see a color, and here's the company names here in the, the vertical axis, here are the years on the horizontal axis. So anytime you see a color, that means that company, in this case, in this case AT&T, was one of the largest three companies in the U.S. stock market at this given time. So as we move from left to right, you see the AT&T was a corporate titan from 1950, call it, to the mid-90s. There, there's a spell where they fell out of favor, but this was a pretty impressive run for 35 plus years. And then when you get a blank white box, that means they've fallen off the, the top three pedestal. Okay, so there's a clear pattern here. Once these companies make it into the top three, it's really hard to sustain that through time. Okay, I think AT&T had a really good run, but over the last 25 years, they've fallen off the top three. Same thing for GM, really good run from 1950 to 1970. And then over the past 55 years, they've fallen out of the top three. So you can see, same thing for DuPont, and same thing for Kodak and IBM. So the message is, it's great to ascend to the top three, to, to make it up the, cor the corporate mountaintop. It's really, really hard to stay there. So I think, again, this is a cautionary tale. It's great to own big tech. It's great to have concentrations in big tech. That certainly worked. But I think future returns, future expectations, you just need to be mindful of history that at some point the party is going to come to an end. Um, I'm not saying you can't generate a positive return in those names, but just the sheer size of some of these companies, th $3 trillion market caps, it's, it's pretty hard to double from that huge size because you run the risk of being larger than the entire economy, which, which probably doesn't scale. So here's Apple, Alphabet, and Amazon, and you can see they've been uh, in the top three in Apple's case uh, since, call it 2009, 2010, and they've had a pretty good run for the last 15 years. Alphabet, a little shorter period on top, and then Amazon has had a couple periods where they, they're in the top three. Probably the most uh, impressive run in modern times has been Microsoft. So you can see they started um, cracking the top three in late 90s, and they've managed to basically be one of the top three companies for the last 24 years. Okay, this is a really nice compliment to that last chart. So this is from DFA Funds, and I've shared this in a past blog. So this looks at almost 100 years of data. And what we're doing is tracking the large top 10 company performance, so a top 10 company in the S&P 500 performance before joining the top 10, and then future returns after they've joined the top 10, okay? So what this says, and this is probably not groundbreaking, but you wanna try to invest in these emerging, growing companies before they get huge. And I think the numbers support that. So if you invested in a, a company before joining the top 10, 10 years before, that's 12% annualized, five years before, 20% annualized, three years before, about 27% every single year. So again, investing in those companies early before they crack the top 10. Once they do crack the top 10, we track that too. So after joining the top 10 largest companies, you can see future returns three years after cracking the top 10, five years after, and 10 years after leave a lot to be desired. And going back to this page, I think the evidence does support that. So once you grow to a certain size, it's really hard to replicate that future performance. So for the last slide, this is real S&P returns over various time frames. And the reason why I'm showing this, I feel like there is a growing cohort of investors that think good investing is just piling into the S&P 500. They're saying, hey, this has been the best performing equity asset class. Uh, there's, there's no end in sight. I'm just gonna keep plowing money into the S&P. There's even some folks that are retired that think they should invest 100% in their assets in the S&P 500. So what this shows is periods of good performance 
And certainly the last 14 years for the S&P has been great, fueled by big tech. So, so how this reads, for the last 14 years, an S&P 500 investor uh, achieved an 11% return every single year. And that's only rivaled by a couple periods. So 1982 to 1999, certainly a great period for the S&P 500. And again, 1942 to 1965 as well. However, the other side of this is there's, there have been sustained periods, sustained long periods of underperformance from the S&P 500. Probably the one that is most recent, but people have already forgot about, is 2000 to 2008, where the S&P for eight years lost 6% a year. Okay. But again, it wasn't a straight line. It's not like you lost 6% every year. Some years you lost a lot more. Some years you might have been flat. Um, but the moral of the story is what's in favor can become out of favor, and there's no flashing red light that tells you when things are going to flip. This is why we diversify. This is why we manage our position sizing because uh, markets move in cycles, and I think this is clear going back uh, to 97 years of data, there's periods of great performance for the S&P. Certainly, we just got through one of those periods or in the middle of one of those periods. But often, the next fav phase of the cycle is less kind uh, to U.S. large cap investors. And that's why, again, we, we add to other out-of-favor equity asset classes. We own gold. We own Bitcoin. We own bonds. Because no one knows when the next ugly phase of the cycle is going to come. And many of our clients are retired or about to retire, and they just can't take some of these large periods of underperformance or losing money, especially if they're taking funds out of their portfolio. So I hope this helped understand the current market dynamics. It's, it's a top-heavy market. Uh, it's great if you've owned U.S. large cap stocks the last 15 or 16 years. But as we've seen, once you're on top of the corporate mountain, so these handful of companies that make up a big chunk of the S&P, it's really hard to stay on top, and it's really hard to replicate that outstanding performance. So let us know if you have any questions. Uh, we always appreciate your feedback, or if you want us to touch on a certain topic, shoot us a note at insight at pureportfolios.com. Thanks. We'll see you next month.